We bout to party Unrestricted Got the house now We gon' turn it up Up, bring the house down Got that big space pump And make them bounce now Flossing like they bossing And the freaks are coming out now Welcome everyone to AEW Unrestricted I'm Aubrey Edwards Along with my co-host and best friend Will Washington How you doing today, Will? I'm doing great, Aubrey This has been... Quite a great time in pro wrestling. Just this last month, going from Double or Nothing to to Forbidden Door. Yes. Oh my God. Forbidden Door is right around the corner. Yeah, it is all right around the corner. And like having people show up and getting to meet people for the first time is always an exciting time for me. Like last year, Forbidden Door was my first experience with that of getting to meet um, guys from New Japan. And this year, uh, we've got Stardom talent coming in this time. We've got CMLL involved. And so, like, you know, I got to meet Stephanie Vacker for the first time last week, or not last week, but last month, and that was really cool. Mm -hmm. And just watching the way that this card is shaping up and coming together and seeing Forbidden Door kind of take on a new meaning, like, it's it's all been really, really cool. It's so great to think, like, five years ago before AEW that this was never a possibility, but now you can absolutely have people from different companies wrestling each other on a pay-per-view, and now it's like a thing that happens so frequently that we expect it. Like, never in a million years would I have thought that I see Tanahashi backstage and he goes, how are you, my friend? And he gives me a hug. I'm like, this is the president of New (laughs) Japan. But, like, we've gotten to meet multiple times because of this awesome association between New Japan, between AEW, this amazing pay-per-view that happens. It's just a great celebration of wrestling, and I'm so excited we get to go to New York. We actually have Rocky Romero coming on the podcast next week to help us preview the the card as it comes up because Rocky Romero is... Is, has his fingers in friggin' everything in wrestling. <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean, like I said before, he's the sixth most powerful man in pro wrestling. Like, uh, it's a thing. To, fifth? Uh, that's might a, be up there. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing Tony Khan says very often. And the fact that he has so many roles across the industry, having him on our side is definitely a very cool thing to have. So I look forward to talking with him next week. I work with, with uh, Rocky a lot. So to bring him on this show is going to be really cool. Uh, but today is also really cool because we we... This is being released on a day that we're taping Collision and having just done Dynamite. The back-to-back days, I actually like the back-to-back days a lot. And I think today is actually a very fitting day to have the guest we have on. All right. All right. So stop beating around the bush. Who's our guest today, Will? Well, Aubrey, we're joined by the one and only, I won't say one and only, he's half of the voices of Ring of Honor. He is... Ian Riccoboni. Ian, thanks for being here on AEW Unrestricted. Oh, geez. Thank you so much for having me. And what a day, right? Allentown tonight as the as this is being released, my hometown. I can't wait. There's so much. I mean, AEW is going crazy. Forbidden door all in. But to me, the number one place in the world is getting AEW at, at the day that this is released. It's incredible. The timing of it couldn't work better. I remember like Stacy, our producer, sends in the uh, calendar invite and I was like, Ian Riccoboni, okay, well, when is this release? Okay, six to it. Oh, oh, this could <laughs> not be better. This is literally coming out the day that we are in Allentown, our own, our, our homeboy's hometown. Like, this is fantastic. And I know how excited you are because I've seen like, uh, you've been doing some like marketing and promotion for Allentown. Like, oh, yeah. I've, I've been <laughs> what does it mean street. to you to have? Yeah, what does it mean to you to have AEW coming to Allentown? It's crazy. Uh, Allentown hasn't had a live wrestling broadcast ever. Number one, they haven't had a taped cable broadcast ever. Uh, the last time that we had taped wrestling from Allentown was 1984, and now our sister city, Bethlehem, in the Lehigh Valley has gotten all kinds of wrestling over the years. So it's it's a little disingenuous to say the region hasn't gotten any. But, you know, Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, it makes up the Lehigh Valley. My beloved Iron Pigs, I'm wearing the, the special Foss Knot hat today. There we go. Allentown specifically, though, has been kind of left in the cold. And it has such a rich wrestling history. Orville Brown, the first ever NWA world champion. I, I was going to say, I feel like the name Allentown, Pennsylvania is burned in my head for wrestling reasons. Is it yeah. really just because of Billy Kidman's entrance? Is that the only reason that, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Billy Kidman, the Nasty Boys, for eight years, the WWWF taped TV here and broadcast okay. from here. From there, we've had 11 tag team championship changes in Allentown proper. We've had infinite number of cards at the Allentown Fairgrounds over the years. And again, it dates back to 1938, as far as I know. So to have something come 
back to Allentown, where on the same street that 1938 card happened, like literally two blocks away, is incredible. There's such a rich wrestling history here, a rich fan base, and now fans don't have to drive to Philadelphia. They don't have to drive to New York City to go see something as high quality as AEW, something that's worth their time, money, and energy, something that's bringing some of the best wrestlers in the world, uh, where the best wrestle right here in Allentown. And, and Allentown's going to be where the best wrestle. Oh, hell yeah. It's also going to be where some of our best commentators are commentating, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I mean, I know uh, Tony and Nigel are excited. I've you know, I, I, I've made it clear that, hey, I'll be in Allentown that day if you need me. <laughs> so Yeah, just just as a hint. <laughs> just as a hint. You know, and to the, the question earlier, you know, from Will, it's it's one of those things where there's a possibility Ring of Honor uh, may tape some matches in Allentown. And coming up on my 10th anniversary over seven and a half years as the, the voice of Ring of Honor, I never thought I'd see the day where Ring of Honor would come to Allentown. We came close in, in 20... 2021, as the pandemic started to kind of slow down, as we started to get the vaccine, we almost went to the fairgrounds. There's a story that I don't that uh, Gary Jester, a longtime personal friend, reached out, and they couldn't quite support the uh, electronics needed to, to to honestly keep everything on the grid and <laughs> keep the TV show running. But <laughs> it, it, it was it, we we're real close. But now this is a reality. You casually dropped in there like you've been in the business now about 10 years, you said? Yeah, I've been with Ring of Honor for 10 uh, in wrestling for about 11. Yeah, 11. OK, wow. So wh- how, d- how did you initially get your start into wrestling? Loved wrestling uh, pretty much since the day I was born. I, I used to get separation anxiety from my parents when they would drop me off at the babysitter. And we lived in this trailer park in Allentown, and they would just walk me across to the other trailer. And there's a wonderful older woman named Pat and her husband, Bob. And Bob ha- always had this stone-faced look on it, on him. And if you didn't know any better, you'd have thought he was the meanest, roughest, toughest guy you'd ever meet. Uh, but he was the sweetest guy in the world. And I remember this from being two and three years old. And the way they'd settled me down was, was putting on wrestling, because I'd get real upset when my mom dropped me off and walked out the door. Uh, from there, you know, we just started going to all kinds of events over the years. My mom would take me. She loved ravishing Rick Rude, which I, that <laughs> my dad kind of looks like Rick Rude. So that explains something there. <laughs> but yeah, we just, we had a lot of fun together. My mom always supported it. My sister used to paint me uh, like Demolition and the Road Warriors growing up. And then I went to school for broadcasting and media and communications. And I just looked for opportunities to do public access TV. And so I did a Phillies show. Uh, we did It was a, a web show in 2011. Uh, it got picked up in 2012. Uh, we did public access for a year. It got picked up by Comcast Sportsnet in Philadelphia. I started interviewing famous Phillies. Um, it was surreal. You know, I, I would talk to Roy Holiday. I would talk to Jim Bunning. I would talk to, um, you know, just these Hall of Fame pitchers and players and future Hall of Famers. And then one day I said, well, what if I just interviewed famous Phillies fans? And the first one was Mark Summers. And it was super exciting. It was super cool. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. He's a huge Phillies fan, right? Because uh, they taped Double Dare in Philadelphia when it first started. So he's just. I he's didn't just, know that. I, I, I had no but, idea. No, I would have assumed just like Orlando, like everything else in, from that time period. Yeah. So when they first started, I think it was 1986. The first place they taped it was the PBS Studios in Philadelphia. And that was the syndicated version before it was on Nickelodeon. And then it got on Nick and then it became more popular on Nick. And then in 1990, when the studios were built, they moved it down there. But he's he's maintained residence in Philly ever since. And it, that was super cool because he was one of my idols. I like I have pictures of me in Double Dare shirts from when I was a kid. Could you ever see yourself hosting Double Dare? Because I could. Oh, I could oh, totally God, see I that. I love it. I would. Oh, that would be wrestling's my dream job, but double there would be so much fun, especially now that I have kids and I coach sports and just, just love being around kids more than I knew. Cause I was, I was the baby of the family, like the baby baby. So I was never around kids until I became a dad, but, but yeah, so that leads to that. I'm interviewing famous uh, Phillies fans. I interviewed the blue meanie at the monster factory. And I, I kind of pull him aside and Danny cage who runs the monster factory. I say, Hey, what if, you know, what if my friend wanted to get involved in wrestling? And they gave me My very, friend. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they gave me super detailed instructions and I followed them to a team <laughs> and like, you literally did the asking for a friend. This is great. Yeah. And asking it w- for a friend who is me. 
Right. And Danny to this day was like, I knew what you were doing. Like I didn't, but <laughs> it, it was, it was cool because at that point, YouTube was starting to be a viable option for independent wrestling and they wanted to add commentary and the technology was becoming more affordable and better quality. And so I just got reps that way. Fast forward to July 22nd, I'm down in Laurel, Delaware with Mark and Jay Briscoe, Future of Honor 2. And that was when I started with Ring of Honor. I'd gotten to know the executive producer at the time, Delirious, and I'd started to come around the ROH dojo. And just again, like folks are willing to give you really good advice if you come in with an open mind. And I was very fortunate along the way to to get a whole bunch of really good advice really quickly. But yeah, it was just a series of just saying yes. I met Colin Jost years ago. As weird as that sounds, he did a stand-up gig. I was the house band that opened for him. I played bass. And um, I just said, hey, I'm looking. I do this baseball show. I'm looking to do more stuff. You write for SNL. What what should I do? And he just said, yes, say yes to everything and figure it out later. I, I want to know more about this house band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we were called the Green Mountain Rebels because we are not from Vermont and we are not rebels. But we saw we, <laughs> we were coming home from a, a, a gig and we had a really bad name. We were called Cutting Edge and nothing about us was Cutting Edge. And we were coming home from a gig out in Kutztown, and we saw this flag in front of a Green Mountain coffee sign, and we thought it'd be really funny to call ourselves the Green Mountain Rebels. And there, we didn't use the flag or the imagery or anything I detest it, but there, there was just this funny name because it was four suburban kids, and we played Springsteen songs and ACDC stuff and had our own originals. And uh, my buddy Chris uh, comes to AEW events. He was down in Philly, uh, so we've still stayed in touch. He ended up working for Conan and SNL. Uh, himself. And that's actually how I met Colin Jost. But that's like, yeah, I played bass. I sang. It was a good time. Oh, uh, th- this this podcast is going in all kinds of different it, directions. It really is, and I'm yeah. just like, I'm here for it. This is friggin' awesome. Oh, my God. So so you show up at, at Future of Honor 2, you started with ROH. Yeah. Like, how does that work? Do you sort of just have a tryout? Or do they know that you have this background in broadcasting? Like, like what what gets you from saying yes to every opportunity to getting in the seat with a headset on? Yeah. I would just drive and show up places to the point I was annoying. Sounds like indie wrestling. That's the best way to get it. That sounds like pro wrestling. <laughs> yeah. And to the point where I I drove to a tryout camp, which was nearby in Bristol, Pennsylvania. And they had, I was kind of a ringer because they knew I had a background in broadcasting. And again, they introduced me to Delirious. And I got in front of him and I was able to, to call some things and do some stand-up interviews. Punishment Martinez was there, former Ring of Honor World Television Champion. Dalton Castle was there, and he was trying out as well. There was a number of wrestlers that went on to be somebody at that particular camp. And I was able to sit down, and I, I didn't realize what an opportunity I had, because they pulled me in a room with, with Delirious, who at the time really controlled the look, the feel, everything of the show. And I essentially got to a kind of privately audition. I just started calling things and doing interviews and Adam Cole. I remember I did a stand up with Adam Cole, who was there just to kind of help with the camp and with Jay Briscoe. And it seemed to fit. And at the time I was going to be the backstage interviewer and the backup play by play person. And I was going to start with future of honor. They were going to do kind of, they wanted to do what AEW dark became. Uh, I just, just never got the resources so we would have Future of Honor matches, one on every card, but we could never kind of replicate the first two full cards. So I would drive and show up where I could. I remember driving overnight to Kalamazoo, to Dayton, Ohio, to Nashville, Tennessee. And then the first time I got let loose on a regular Ring of Honor show was about a year later in Dayton, Ohio. And there was a storyline where my friend Steve Carino, he, he got banned, he got suspended for doing something to another wrestler as a commentator, and you can't do that. And so they didn't think it through that he got banned the night before and that they didn't have (laughs) anybody else. And I just happened to drive the nine hours to get to Dayton, Ohio, from southeastern Pennsylvania. So (laughs) they threw me on the headset, and I got to call my first card there. And from there, it just became addictive. It just was, hey, all right, great. There's a card in San Antonio. They told me if I show up, I get paid X amount of dollars. So I'm going to use frequent flyer miles and I'm going to get to San Antonio. There was a card in Florida. Well, great. My brother's down in Florida. I'm going to drive and go see him with my wife. And I'm going to happen to just pop into the Ring of Honor event while I'm there. And it was stuff like that until 
they couldn't kind of shake me loose. The team that we had, which included Nigel McGuinness, both departed at the end of 2016. And that's when I had an opportunity uh, to, to step in. And I had a number of partners at first. I really did. I had everybody from Mark Briscoe to Silas Young, who's been on uh, across areas of Ring of Honor. And then Colt Cabana was the best fit out of the gate. And then when Colt decided he, he wanted to wrestle again, uh, I was blessed to have Caprice Coleman fall into my life. So, Oh, my God. Yeah, he and I have been together for five years now, which is just insane. And you guys continue to be such a money duo. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the experience you had with other commentators, particularly with Colt Cabana. And uh, we're going to talk about all of that when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, it's Aubrey and Will with our special guest, Ian Riccoboni. Ian, uh, we were talking earlier in the show about some of the partners you've had, of course, for the last five years you've been with Caprice Coleman. Um, in 2017, though, you talked about being paired with Colt Cabana, who hadn't made his return to wrestling yet, and it's kind of been uh, a mainstay of Ring of Honor, so having him on commentary really made a whole lot of sense, and I think... Because he was such a name, people associated with Ring of Honor, he really brought a lot of the history of the company to the commentary table. Did you really feel like you got that experience with him being with Colt during that period? Yeah, and the best thing about Colt was he was a lot like my like my actual older brother, Bill, where he wasn't afraid to call me out on my stuff. And if I threw a joke and it didn't land... He would tell me if I was trying to be too funny and wasn't serious enough. He would tell me if I was being too serious and not lighthearted. He would tell me. And he just has a real great feel for wrestling, which is very apparent when he wrestles or does anything involved in wrestling. He is such a great person to break in with because he's not afraid to deliver that type of feedback in a very straightforward way that makes sense, but also doesn't make you feel horrible. And so I really enjoyed working with him. He's become a great friend. He was at my house a couple of days before my daughter was born. He flew in to record episodes of Ring of Honor in 2019 because they they told me, "Hey, your your wife is <laughs> your wife's going to have your daughter any day now. We don't want you to miss it. Like, stay home. We're going to film these. We'll cut them up. Colt will come to your house." And um, there was like a there was like a 50 percent chance Colt would have had to deliver our daughter Nora. And I, I he was so so good at everything else. I would I would have trusted him to do so. So yeah. he brought just energy, enthusiasm, gravitas. Uh, his first match in Ring of Honor was Final Battle 2002. So at that point, 15 years in to the company, and he knows all the styles. And he's he's a great analyst because he can point out when someone has borrowed something from a style or a technique, uh, stuff that viewers, they might see a cool move, but they don't know where it comes from or how it's executed. And, and Colt really was great at pointing that out. I, I love that you're giving Colt Cabana all of his flowers because like, as you're saying all of that, I'm just like, oh my God, I agree with all of this. Like he's just <laughs> so good at making whoever he is working with better. Like I've had that experience with him as well, just being like a referee and he's like a an agent on a match in particular and just kind of hearing how he delivers things and his just understanding of wrestling is insane. And it's so great that you had the opportunity to sort of like come up with someone like that, sort of guiding you in that direction. I'm curious because anytime we talk to commentators, you guys have just this like crazy vantage point of what it is we do. You see it up close, you see it personal, but at the same time, you're enjoying the product, but you're also trying to get everyone else to who's watching it to keep up with it and understand it and introduce all the storylines. Like, how do you approach commentary on a show? Like, what sort of preparation do you have? What sort of research do you do? Like, how do you bring the Ian Riccoboni spin onto the commentary role? Yeah, that's a great question. I kind of view it from a really selfish point. Like, what's in it for me? And what I mean by that is, if I was watching, what would I want to know? You know, when I watch a broadcaster or watch the Phillies or watch the Iron Pigs or watch whoever, I think, well, well, geez, where did, where did this guy come from? Or wow, this is a massive hitting streak. What's the record? Or how is this How is this player You know, pitched against this hitter? So I look for matchup details. I look for historic details, time of year details, event-specific details. 
And I have those in my back pocket. And one of the things that Colt was really great at when working with Colt was when I first started, I would just, I would just kind of vomit them out. Like, oh, he's five and one against this person and this, this, and this, and this, this, and this. Meanwhile, the match is halfway through. Something interesting's happened and I've railroaded right through it. Colt was really great at kind of helping me understand the ebbs and flows and emotion. I try to approach it almost musically. I've played bass for a long time. I played viola and oboe growing up. So I'm not quite classically trained, but I have many, many years and thousands of dollars of lessons that my parents probably wonder what they were for in in those instruments. They were for this. (laughs) They were for this. They were. But it, it helps you understand why people get connected. And if you can hit the crescendos, the decrescendos, if you can hit uh, the accents in the music and naturally with care and authenticity, that's going to give something to the viewer that adds on to what's happening in the ring. And sometimes sometimes it's the excitement, it's the rapid fire. Other times it's saying nothing at all. I remember matches where the best thing I could do was just drop out, let the crowd hear the ref hit three, and let the let the crowd hear let the uh, folks at home hear the crowd explode. So it's one of those things that where you kind of have to orchestrate and and have a feel for for what's going on. But yeah, I, I the oboe lessons I took and the viola lessons really helped me honestly give me an idea of of kind of the ebbs and flows. And I over prepare. I'm on I'm on cage match. There's a guy Striga who runs who runs Cage Match on Twitter. Who, if someone's not on Cage Match, I'm DMing him the night before, <laughs> saying, "Hey, who is who is this? Why aren't they on? Why aren't they on Cage Match?" I try and look up news articles to find interesting tidbits. Um, if I'm in person, I try and track down the person in the locker room. If I'm not, Caprice and I are blowing up their their DMs. If it's somebody that we're calling a tape match of, so yeah, we we try and over prepare because you can always not use something. But the worst feeling in the world is having an opportunity to say something or do something interesting and not having anything in your pocket to use. Well, talking about Ring of Honor and, of course, All Elite Wrestling, you can't really talk about either without talking about kind of the origins of AEW and where it all kind of got started, which was an event called All In in 2018. And at All In, Sears Center in... Hoffman Estates. I almost wanted to say Chicago, but then Chicagoans get mad at you when you do that. They do. They do. But uh, at Hoffman Estates, uh, you got to be a part of that first event with Don Callis and Excalibur, who are, of course, two big AEW mainstays today. But uh, I want to talk about kind of how that commentary team came together, why that team was who was decided on, and that night in general. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this, Will, because over the years... I've kind of told this to people offhand and they don't believe me. And then I say, ask Tony Schiavone and everybody believes Tony and he he can back this up. So when the idea first came about, we were in Philadelphia and I was standing with, with Cody and with Nick and Matt and they came up to me. They said, what are you doing on, uh, and I have, I have these up here. What are you doing? September 1st, Mm. 2018. And I say, well, I, if we don't have an event, I don't know. And they said, keep keep your Labor Day open. I said, why? And they said, well, we're doing this thing and Ring of Honor is going to be behind it a little bit too. So don't worry about having to ask for permission. We want you and Colt and Tony Schiavone to be the broadcast team for this big event. We're going to try and get people from Impact. We're going to try and people from New Japan, from CMLL. And I I thought, wow, that's that's great. Thanks for thinking of me. And as we get maybe a couple of weeks down the line people start getting the all-in graphics. And I'm wondering if maybe they changed their mind or if, they, you know, the, the commentator, and the commentators really don't need to be on the marquee. Like we have, we have Jim Ross, the, the greatest of all time. We have, we have Tony Schiavone, arguably 1A, 1B of, of wrestling commentary. And we don't need to put them on the, with all due respect, folks are watching the program for them, but they're not coming to the building for them. And I, there's a little bit of a difference. So, you know, the all-in graphics start rolling out and I'm seeing these names and I'm excited because it's Okada and it's it's the Bucks, obviously. And then it's uh, Omega, who wasn't making many US appearances then. So the huge amount of talent and I'm getting excited. And then a uh, number comes in that I've ne- I'd never had my phone before. And it was Cody. And he said, hey, Tony Schiavone's out. And I said, oh, no. And I said, why? Georgia football. And I go, okay. So uh, it was yeah. Yeah, it was a Saturday and he couldn't make it work. And then he said, hey, and Colt's out too. And I said, why is Colt out? <laughs> and he said, Colt wants to wrestle. It's going to be a huge crowd. <laughs> it's going to be near Chicago. Colt wants to wrestle. So I said, 
fine. He goes, who would you, who would you want to have? And I, I said, well, do you know the, the PWG guy Excalibur? And he said, not really. And I said, ask Nick and Matt, they know him. I think, I think he'd be a great fit. And so they ask him, he's in. And so great, wonderful. And then it's, it's brought up and they say, somebody suggests Don Callis and it might've been Kenny or, but I remember Matt Jackson coming up to me. He goes, you don't got any heat with Don Callis, do you? I go, I've never met him. <laughs> I've never, <laughs> that's usually never a met. question with like, like that has to begin, right? <laughs> right. And I go, I've never met him. And he go, great. Uh, would you mind doing commentary with Don Callis? And I said, I'd love to, because I remembered him from ECW and I remember just kind of being, you know, the smarmy, uh, pompous man that he is that we all know. And, put up with. I wouldn't say no one love, no one tolerate. We love to hate. We love to hate. There you go. And we had some we had some fun special guests that night too, but uh that's kind of how it came together. And it, it germinated as Cody, I think, really took after Tony Shivani. He really loved and adored him. And as we all genuinely do. And Tony at that point had started doing some MLW at that point. And it was clear that Tony still had his fastball. And I think Cody saw this, and I think Cody saw this as a great opportunity to get him back in front of some major eyeballs. And I was I was heartbroken. I have a picture with him from the StarCast because that was the first time I met him, and he was such a sweetheart. And I thought, man, I missed my shot. I would have got to call some wrestling with Tony. Little did I know it would happen dozens of times <laughs> later. But but yeah, at the moment, I was like, man, that, that, what could have been? I mean, honestly, what I took away from that story is that you may have gotten Excalibur his job. And no, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it was, he's talented enough. It would have happened regardless. And that's, that's a fact. And if anything, I credit him for getting me into AEW and, and getting me a spot. I, I think you guys can kind of credit each other. Like it's almost <laughs> a, uh, like it almost, if you guys didn't have each other, how would that have gone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel horrible because Colt can tell you this. I was, talking to Colt in the locker room at all in and the I was talking to Colt and I said wow I wish I wish you decided to do it tonight and I didn't know what Excalibur looked like without his mask and who's sitting right there who I have not yet introduced myself to <laughs> oh no <laughs> I have to tell you I had a very similar experience like the first time I had to meet him and it was my first day of work at AEW. <laughs> oh boy. And of course, you know, his announcer voice is a lot different than the guy when you're just talking to him. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was very much like, I didn't quite know who I was talking to. Yeah. Then he said something and it, uh, it was the way he said it. I went, oh, this is Excalibur. Okay. <laughs> got it. Makes sense. Uh, but I had the same experience my first day at work. So like, I, I fully understand that if you don't know what he looks like, they can completely throw you off. So yeah, yeah, and we became Pokemon Go friends that night. We became Pokemon Go best friends within the shortest period possible. This all makes sense. Yeah, we, we kept in touch. <laughs> we kept in touch as AEW was beginning to form. You know, there there was some discussion. He was on board first. There was a brief discussion. Hey, Ian, when's your deal up? When's this? And there are opportunities over the years that I, I've. I've kind of stuck loyal to, to Ring of Honor for, for a few reasons, but I have very young kids, five and seven, and it really means a lot. My dad worked a lot, a lot, like 80 hours a week a lot when I was a kid, and he came to every sporting event he could. He came to every baseball game he could, but he was just tired and exhausted. And even when we go on vacation, you know, he, we would go on these great trips to Disney World or, or the Jersey Shore, and he would just be exhausted and just trying to recover from the work and everything. And so, you know, over the years, I've, I've just tried to keep that in mind, especially once we've had kids, you know, and there, there's part of me when AEW launched, I was kind of like, wow, like that could have been Excalibur and I and, J and JR, or that could have been whomever. And I, I carried that with me. That was kind of unresolved for a while. And as All In was such a big success, and then it kind of leads into the, the formation of AEW, it, it took some time to figure that out. I was... I, I would say the word jealous or confused or, but the first double or nothing, I went outside and put together lawn furniture. And if you know anything about me, that was the, the least likely thing that I was going to do. But it was such an event where I knew everything had changed. And I should have picked up on the signals 
at All In when there was AAA and CMLL guys wrestling each other and when there was Impact and Ring of Honor guys wrestling each other at the time. But it was kind of a moment of, okay, everything's different. Did I make the right decision? And the answer to me was, yes, I'm here for my daughter. My daughter was just born in February. Yes, I'm here. Like right now, right place, right time. Like this for now is good. And I'm still living my dream as a wrestling announcer. But there was some kind of like weird kind of heartbreak as, as Ring of Honor stock had gone down. And the pandemic, we had higher TV ratings than we ever had syndicated wise. It was crazy. No one, <laughs> we could have no one in the arena, but more people than ever were watching us on the local affiliates. So it was just a strange two years. <laughs> it was strange. But at the same time, like, it's so great the way that it worked out, right? Mm-hmm. That that you're here, your your voice is still synonymous with Ring of Honor. We get the opportunity to see you from time to time on AEW broadcasts. And I'm just so thrilled that sort of your attitude of always say yes to everything, but also staying true to what you care about, like being a father that is there with his kids, which is extremely hard in this business. So mm-hmm. you literally can have your cake and eat it too. The Ian Riccoboni story. That's, that's <laughs> the title of your future book. <laughs> I, I'm so lucky. I haven't I, I haven't talked much to Tony, but he left us tickets. He left anybody that was interested could have gone to the Fulham game in Philadelphia when they when they had a, a friendly. And I remember talking to him about that, and I was just so thankful. We, my son, my daughter, my wife, we all came to the the soccer game, and you know, I just I've got to express my gratitude. Like, hey, a lot of other people would have just told me to take a hike and you know, kind of hit the road, and and you didn't. And I appreciate that. And I still get to be associated with this thing I love. I mean, I got ROH stuff all over my room here. I got all the new action figures. I just got the the Vault Van Housen. Like I'm Whoa. and I got the you know, I got the blood and guts Yuda. Like I'm in. Like this this is like it's something that's kind of in my DNA. And I would have been heartbroken if that had to end. I, life would have gone on and I was ready, like at that final battle 2021 where it looked like that was it. Although I did find it suspicious, every AEW wrestler that had ties to ROH was allowed to send in a video, and it was very meticulously produced. I'll just say that. Not that my tin hat's, <laughs> not, not that my tin hat's on, but they were very well produced, <laughs> and they were, they were the top stars. So I don't I'm just, just throwing that out there. Well, we've got a lot more to talk about here on AEW Unrestricted. We're here with Ian Riccoboni, and we're talking his run in and ROH and his commentary career. We talked all in and we're going to be talking much more when all elite wrestling unrestricted continues. AEW unrestricted. It's Aubrey. It's Will. And it's Ian Riccoboni. And I, I, I want to start off with the story that requires a bit of an apology to one Ian Riccoboni. Oh boy. So <laughs> where are we going? Uh, with this? I had a segment I produced uh, not that long ago. It was probably about two months ago on Dynamite. And it was the celebration of Willow Nightingale. And uh, I was putting this segment together. Uh, it was a, this TBS title celebration. It was on April 24th, the April 24th edition of Dynamite. Um, and the segment was going to be crashed by Mercedes Monet. And it was a fun segment to put together. And so a couple of nights before, I'm like working on all the details, working with Stokely on his what he's going to say and coming up with exactly what Willow's going to say and all of that and how this segment's going to go. And then it hit me and I go, oh, how can we do Willow's entrance without the rap? Like, uh, we have to have the rap. Like, that's the only way this works. But I recognize I only have so much of a budget for this segment and that if I ask to fly both Ian and Caprice into Dynamite, they'll probably like ring my neck for that. And so I was like, okay, if I have to pick between the two, I'm going to have to get Caprice for this. And so I pulled Caprice in and, uh, and that, like, I wanted both. And I I wanted both, but I knew that the only way this was going to work is if I got Caprice here. Cause like nothing pops me more than you guys over her entrance music. Like every single time it gets me like, and I might be the only person I might have done that. I might have put that on the show solely to pop me and nobody else. But I knew that's wrestling in a nutshell. (laughs) Like I remember there were certain people like who weren't aware. And they're like, wait, why is Caprice suddenly on commentary? Why is he even in the building? Uh, uh, and I'm like, just just trust me on this one. This is going to be great. And literally, I think I asked him like two days beforehand, maybe even the day before. 
It was very, very short notice, but it was literally just one of those things. But I want to apologize because if I had all of my resources for that, I would have put you in that segment. And I just couldn't in that moment. You know what? Number one, he's he's better. He's an actual better <laughs> rapper. Uh, you should you should hear you should hear him preach. He is. Mm-hmm. He's just got a flow like it's that. Number two, I'm a guest in the culture. I, I you know, I, I'm a guest. I recognize that it's and I can't do it without Caprice. Like he he is my courage. He is my like and I I have uh, five black nephews. Um, my sister in law is black. My brother in law is black. And I love it. And I love everything about it. And I get the best of all. Wor- Again, back, back to that to that point, I get the best of all worlds. I get to have my cake, eat it too. But I recognize that I'm a guest and I'm not the one that should be rapping. <laughs> like that's, like I, <laughs> but I knew like the rap would have been complete if it had had both of you on it. But I knew that, oh, I only get one. <laughs> all right. I've got to get Caprice to Dynamite. I got to get him to Jacksonville. And I am so glad we made it happen, by the way. Because, yeah. uh, again, it might have just been to pop me, but there is nothing I enjoy more <laughs> than you guys on her entrance. And, like, when she gets to make appearances in Ring of Honor, I, like, I know what's happening here. This is going to be great. And uh, there's nothing better to me. So I knew, like, okay, we're doing a celebration of Willow Nightingale. It has to have the rap on it. But I, I brought this story up to segue into the fact that you... And Caprice are such a great duo. You guys are such oh a great God. tandem, such a great combo. You know, you, you've talked about the broadcast partners you've had over the years, but over the last five years, you two are so much fun to listen to. Talk to me about Caprice as a broadcast partner. Oh, thank you. I can't talk to you about him being a partner without talking about the man he is. And we, we are both so aligned. We couldn't be more different, yet we're so much the same. He gets up in the morning and he calls his, his wife because he wants to, not because he has to. He, he FaceTimes his kids because he wants he wants to see what's going on, not because he feels like he has to. He is connected with his community. He volunteers. He's a preacher. You know, every other day I'm asking, asking him about something and he's doing something. He's installing a uh, handrail somewhere for someone that needs it. He's helping build something. He's helping raise money for this. Like, Caprice is the man that I think everybody should want to be, you know, and he's doing that on top of he, he's helping out the wrestling school. He's training some some the young and up and coming stars like uh, he's a commentator, world class commentator. So he's burning the candle at all ends, but he's still making it happen for his family, for the, for the folks in Charlotte at, at many churches. He will take calls from folks he he doesn't know just to reassure them about about life. I mean, that's that's how connected he is. I've, I've seen him before Ring of Honor pay-per-views say, excuse me, and I got to call this. I got to I gotta take this call. You know, someone from my parish asked if they could have somebody call me. They, they're they in a rough spot right now. And he will drop everything and take that call and make sure that they're okay. Even though in an hour, in 45 minutes, he has to walk through the curtain and be electric and be animated and be, be the caprice that, that we all know. And he's that kind of guy. And when they say shirt off your back, I mean, he's like shirt, shoes, pants, let you drive the car, like, and he will give everything and expect nothing in return. And I, I want to be Caprice Coleman when I grow up. And he's, we're, we're not that much different in age, but like, that's, that's how I view Caprice. And coming in from that perspective, and that's kind of what you see is what you get. That preacher, the, the label of preacher is not a facade. It's not a kind of gimmick that's he lives in and and breathes that kind of attitude um that positivity that hope and that is so fun and freeing to be next to because it makes in wrestling it makes when the good guys are on a roll so much better and when the bad guys are on a roll to so much easier to go hellfire and brimstone (laughs) so there's elements of that that i feed into and really enjoy broadcasting with from a performance element because what you see is what you get. He's the same guy on camera as he is off camera. And there are certain things that he, <laughs> like the Dalton Castle's entrance, I always make, you know, a Dalton unfurls his jumpsuit and he takes it off. I, you know, I go crazy. I hoot and holler. And then he kind of plays back and, and there's stuff like that where, yeah, that's a little bit, that's a little bit real. Like we're, we're going back and forth, but <laughs> You know, but there's other times too where I'm legitimately in the dark when Jack Jameson starts saying stuff about low T and this guy. 
I'm thinking he's talking about some some artist I've never heard of, but he's <laughs> insulting the fans in Las Vegas. Low T would be like, the the probably the funniest rap gimmick of right. all time. <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> So Caprice is like, nah, you know, you would know it if you got it, Ian. And then like I'm like, oh, okay. But we get along so well. We have kind of the same frame of reference. Um you know, my brother was eight years older than I am. I grew up on MTV Raps. I was, you know, I was three, four years old. I was watching Kid and Play. I was watching Vanilla Ice and Hammer, but then quickly Public Enemy. <laughs> like, I was seeing it all at, unfold. And so we have a lot of the same kind of influences of what we saw growing up, which I think we're eight years apart. Me and Caprice are maybe nine years apart. So that's kind of interesting, too, because he'll say something he he referenced PM Dawn the other day on Ring of Honor, and I as I hit him with "Set Adrift on Memory Bliss," and he was like, "You weren't were you alive yet?" And I was like, "Yeah, I was, I was four. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just we're friends first, and that makes it so much easier to just go out and and have fun and, and do a wrestling show. The thing I like about him too is I've had partners in the past, and not Colt, but other folks that. Hey, what do you want me to say? And then it stops there. Or what's this match going to be? All right. Or what's the finish? Or what's this? Nigel's not like that. Nigel's a, a super hardcore preparer. You know, Nigel. Oh, Nigel, yeah. if he does, if he doesn't know it, he looks it up. If he's thinking about quips to say, he'll write them down. And he's very much of that same. I I can write fifteen things down, and if I use one because I'm searching for something great, and the, if the other fourteen I don't use, then I can see if I can fit them in again somewhere else. Caprice is very much, hey, did these folks wrestle before? Let's walk through that match. What'd they do? What led up to this? Can we call back something else? Was Oh, this was like a different match that happened three years ago. Is that too old? Is that too new? Is that relevant? And he's willing to have those conversations about about every match. And I've commentated with some people that are just like, yeah, you know what? It's a match. It's the 10th time they're wrestling each other. I Whatever. Like, they're... They're five and four or what, you know, it's whatever. And then with Caprice, it's like, well, how did, you know, he'll think back, well, how did he win that match? Or how did she win that match? All right. So, you know, when they go for the figure four, get really hyped because that's how they won last time. And we'll, we'll talk through that. So we're on the same wavelength of, all right, look for the callbacks, look for the, the references, the energy, remember how we got here, remember what led up to it. And we have such great video editors at AEW and Ring of Honor that, Usually there's a package that'll lead up to it, but for some of the matches with more local talent on Ring of Honor, that can be tougher. So Caprice and I really dig into those. God, that's so great. I just, I just love when you found like someone who is such a great teammate that like elevates you at the same way that you elevate them. But it's also great hearing sort of how you talk about Cole because it's like, oh, there's a common denominator here. All right, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it out here. <laughs> I think I might know what it is. <laughs> Regardless, yeah. <laughs> regardless. So you, you've been a part of a lot of major moments in wrestling. We, we talk about All In 2018. You were also part of the broadcast crew for the G1 Supercard at Madison Square Garden in 2019, yeah. which was the first non-WWE wrestling event there since 1960. So that's crazy. One, what was that like? And two, are there any other like major moments in your mind that really stick out as like, this was freaking awesome? Yeah. Yeah. That was wild. I, over the years, I've become very good friends with Carrie Silken, who bought Ring of Honor in 2003, uh, sold it in 2011. Carrie never made a dime on Ring of Honor, and he ran it strictly on passion and love. And he ran a great ticket resale business over the years called Rave Review Tickets. He was great at predicting winners on Broadway, and that's how he made his fortune. That's how he would take that money and reinvest it. And he reinvested it into Samoa Joe and to Brian Danielson and, and all the wrestlers that we love from, the, from that Nigel and into that classic area era. And so heading into Madison Square Garden, um, I'd gotten to know Kerry quite well over the last couple of years before that. And he would tell me stories about going to see Bruno San Martino at the old garden. And and then he would tell me about, well, Pedro won the, Pedro Morales won the title. And then he'd see Pedro at the New Garden. And then it was Superstar Billy Graham and Bruno again. And then he, you know, spinning the gate at the first WrestleMania. And, and so where that's when you pay for one ticket, but you kind of tail the person behind you and you get two in for the price of one. And I said, well, where'd you sit? He goes, we just sat in the aisle. And he said, nobody kicked you out. He said, there were so many people that spun the gate that day. 
they couldn't keep people out of the aisles. And if you go back and watch that, you can actually see the stairwells are just full of people. The aisleways are just full of people. It's crazy. There was way more people than there should have been that day. <laughs> but for me, it was special because I got to see Carrie kind of see this thing that he loved and cared about for eight years and just put his time, money, energy into never really asking for anything back and him getting to see it be a part of Madison Square Garden, this place he went to as a teenager, as a kid, where he saw Jethro Tull, where he saw Springsteen, where he saw every you know, all these major musical artists. So to see it through his eyes was amazing, but it was also a place where when I went to college at NYU, I could never afford to go there. So it was it was one of these things where I went to one Knicks game because I got tickets through the college for $10, but that was it. And I just remember walking in that day, I was in the service elevator with Shane Taylor and he and I were just talking. I said, this is pretty big, huh? He goes, yeah, let's go look at the ceiling, which is not your first instinct in most buildings, but the garden has... The garden is the place to do it, though. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) It has that historic kind of circular ceiling, and it's got that dome-like structure. And I just remember staring at the picture of of Jimi Hendrix in the back playing the garden. I remember just like staring at the Springs. I'm a huge Springsteen fan. Yeah, I got my Dennis Wilson shirt. The Beach Boys have played there before. Like so many folks that are so important to me and memories that I've had with Carrie, memories I've had with my parents, you know, my dad playing Hendrix in the car uh, when I was a kid and getting into Springsteen when I was a teenager and skipping school and going to the Stone Pony, like that, that kind of stuff, that made it super special because you realize everything that you've, you've worked for, uh, those eight hour drives to Dayton, those overnights from Kalamazoo, spending frequent flyer miles from, you know, a, a job that you have to get to San Antonio to get a hundred bucks. All of those things suddenly have become worth it because you're calling Jay White versus Okada for the IWGP title in the world's most famous arena. That was super awesome. Damn. Yeah. And that, you know, on top of that, um, you know, folks look at 2019 as kind of a year in transition for Ring of Honor. It's obviously when AEW started, but I had some of my favorite road trips in 2019. Um, I got lost in the Smoky Mountains with Okamura from CMLL, and I didn't speak mm-hmm. much Spanish. And Mark Haskins was in the car as well, and Joe Hendry, and they spoke varying degrees of different types of English, and as did I. And Caprice was in the car as well, so we were all trying to communicate, and we all <laughs> we all had different accents. And my Spanish was broken, and I remember Mark speaking a little Spanish, and it wasn't quite what Okamura spoke, and he just wanted to see the mountains because he'd never seen the Smoky Mountains before. We were driving from, I think, Atlanta to Nashville. And I remember a couple of trips with the Briscoes when it was them, Colt, and I believe Jay Lethal. And we were driving and, uh, you know, Jay wanted to see the Chattahoochee River and we saw a sign for it. And so we pulled off and uh, we we pulled off. We we looked at it (laughs) because we love the Alan Jackson song. And I just remember Jay's laugh and enjoying that. And I remember coming back from Toronto. We had summer Supercard later that year in August. Jay had a huge gash in his back after a ladder war and it required stitches, uh, but they were going to close the parking garage. They were literally going to physically lock our car in. And Jay was just like, Hey, Rick, man, I'll put a shirt on Rick. Don't worry about it. And he put on a shirt and we drove back across the border and he's this huge gash that required all kinds of stitches, but we had a great time. We went to the Denny's across the border in, in, um, in Buffalo Somebody ordered spaghetti. I always accuse Chuck Taylor of, of doing it. it. Sounds like a Chuck Taylor thing. It does, but Chuck wasn't with us at the time. So I have this razor sharp memory, but I can't remember who ordered the spaghetti. And it was either Chuck or Juice Robinson, but Juice wasn't on that show, I don't think. So from a wrestling standpoint, I think all in G1 Supercard are my favorite things. But I, I think from from traveling around, I, I think those are, are some of my best memories. And as weird as it was, those the bubble tapings for ROH... I got to know Caprice better than than at any point. You know, we were spending 12, 16 hours together some days because we were the only two people who were allowed to be around each other. So, Oh, my God. Didn't even think about that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this has been an incredible conversation, Ian. Like, genuinely, uh, we could probably talk to you for a few more hours if we had the ability to. But 
this is AEW Unrestricted, and time is what it is. Uh, but seriously, Ian, thank you for being here on AEW Unrestricted. You can, of course, catch new episodes of AEW Unrestricted uh, right here on your favorite podcast feed. Uh, every Thursday, we drop new episodes, new video episodes every Monday on our YouTube channel. You can catch AEW Dynamite every Wednesday on TBS. We've got AEW Rampage every Friday on TNT. AEW Collision is every Saturday on TNT. And, of course, you can hear this man on Ring of Honor every Thursday. Watch ROH.com or in the Ring of Honor app. Thank you for being here with us, Ian. Oh, God, thank you so much for having me. And if you are in the Lehigh Valley, if you're anywhere near the Lehigh Valley, the PPL Center is the place to be. If you're listening to this on Thursday, June 20th, and we all know you are, come on out. <laughs> Ian Orange Cassidy, Wither Yuta, and myself at the Iron Pigs make full of ourselves by now. So come on out, <laughs> support the effort, come out and support the Lehigh Valley. And it's going to be a heck of a night. It's going to be collision, rampage, and maybe, fingers crossed, a little bit of Ring of Honor. It would be a dream come true to call at least one ROH match. I'll say this. I'll put. I'll come out of retirement. I'm 1-0 if I need to. I will I will wrestle in Allentown if needed as long cool. as the says Ring of Honor. I'll just – and it, so <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> oh, boy. I uh. – <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian. This is AEW Unrestricted. We'll see you next time and have a great day. Come on, throw your hands up. Let me see you. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gonna turn it up, up. Bring the house down. Got that big space pumping. Make them bounce now. Blossing like they bossing in the